Bueno, muy buenas noches y bienvenidos al Planetario de Medellín, eh, al programa del Coloquio de Astronomía, se realiza cada semana, que es organizado por el, la Coordinación de Pregrado de Astronomía de la Universidad de Antioquia y el Planetario de Participación. Para la noche del, eh, eh, de hoy tenemos una actividad especial, una actividad muy especial eh, y un invitado de lujo. Eh, la actividad que vamos a realizar, la conferencia que vamos a realizar, hace parte de un programa que se conoce como el programa de instituciones hermanas entre el Observatorio de Leiden en Holanda y la Universidad de Antioquia. Este programa busca eh, que el Observatorio de Leiden, que ofrece el programa de pregrado en física y astronomía, en Europa, apoya el programa de pregrado en Astronomía de la Universidad de Antioquia. Durante estas últimas dos semanas hemos tenido la oportunidad de asistir a, unas, a dos cursos y otras actividades organizadas en el marco del evento. Para la charla de hoy entonces hemos invitado al doctor Bernard Brandt. El profesor Bernard Brandt es eh, doctor en, en, en física del Instituto Max Planck en Múnich, eh, donde desarrolló trabajos de investigación en el área de la astrofísica estelar. Eh, de allí pasó a la Universidad de Cornell, donde estuvo aproximadamente nueve años y donde llegó a ocupar la posición de investigador asociado de la Universidad de Cornell trabajando para los instrumentos, trabajando en la instrumentación del observatorio de Monte Palomar, el famoso telescopio Hale de 5 metros, que fue por mucho tiempo el telescopio más grande del mundo. El profesor Bernard eh, además trabajó en uno de los, con el espectrógrafo del telescopio Spitzer, eh, que es un telescopio infrarrojo, que trabajaba, digamos, al nivel del telescopio espacial Hubble, pero en el infrarrojo. Y más recientemente es co-investigador del instrumento MIRI, que va a ser montado en el telescopio espacial James Webb, que espera ser lanzado entre el 2018 y el 2020. Y también es investigador principal del instrumento METIS, que será instalado en el futuro telescopio extremadamente grande europeo, o el EELT. Eh, adicional a eso, el profesor trabaja como astrofísico, o profesional de astrofísica, en un área que se llama eh, formación estelar explosiva, o Starburst. De modo que combina, digamos, eh, dos eh, habilidades que son muy valiosas, en el mundo de la astronomía y de la física, y la habilidad para trabajar con instrumentos y para trabajar con eh, física y con astrofísica. De modo que, leyendo esta, esta hoja de vida, les puedo asegurar que probablemente Bernard es uno de los astrofísicos más importantes que ha visitado Medellín, y actualmente es uno de los protagonistas de los cambios que se están produciendo en el mundo en la construcción de instrumentos. Bueno, como ustedes saben, eh, la conferencia del profesor Bernard eh, será en inglés. Esta fue una decisión que tomamos, no, 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 no solamente, digamos, como algo que puede, digamos, pensarse una, una medida de snob, sino porque estamos notando que a Medellín está llegando un influjo de investigadores y visitantes extranjeros tan alto que en algún punto nos iba a tocar hacer esto. En algún punto íbamos a tener que ofrecer la conferencia en el idioma internacional de la ciencia. Sin embargo, el mismo nos ha aclarado 
Todo lo que va a decir Bernard está escrito en las diapositivas. A veces, naturalmente, es mucho más sencillo seguir el idioma inglés escrito. Y adicionalmente, en algunos puntos de la conferencia va a ser una pausa para que yo les presente en uno o dos minutos un resumen de lo que se vio en esa primera parte de la charla. Es decir, la idea es eh, que todos se sientan cómodos y que aprovechen esta oportunidad fantástica de conocer una a, un, a, un, a un, digamos, profesional de, de este nivel y que naturalmente empecemos en Medellín a acostumbrarnos a escuchar una, la, la, conferencias en inglés, aunque obviamente, pues, obviamente no, no, no necesariamente tengamos que entender digamos, cada palabra de lo que nos dice. So, Bernard, uh, thank you very much to be here with us. Uh, we are very, okay, we, we appreciate your sacrifice, as, as I told you this, yesterday, and, okay, this is your public. Enjoy this, this talk. Okay. I forgot, I, I forgot, I, olvidé decir que si quieren hacernos una pregunta, por favor dejémosla para el final y puede ser en español o en inglés como ustedes eh, deseen. The question could be in, in Spanish and in English, and, but at the end of the talk. Yeah, muchas gracias, Joaquín. Uh, buenos días. Es un placer estar aquí esta noche. Me siento muy honrado de dar esta charla en su germeso planetario. Desafortunadamente, como Jorge lo ha dicho, yo no hablo español, así que, por favor, permítanme darles mi charla en inglés. So, a warm welcome to all of you uh, here to this talk where I like to give you a short summary of how astronomers nowadays try to measure the universe. This is of course a big title and we will not measure the whole universe in an hour. You may have other dinner plans tonight, so we have to focus on something. And so I thought I will, I will divide my talk in essentially three parts. I would like to start to, to show you how telescopes have evolved, how they were invented, how they have grown, why they grew, and how telescopes look like nowadays. And then, in the second part of this talk, I would like to show you what, uh, what important questions astronomy is trying to address nowadays. Of course, there are many, many challenging problems. There are many things we do not know about the universe. So I can only give you a few examples. But I, I like to show you two examples to illustrate what, astronomies, what astronomy nowadays is, is really making a challenging science, a very interesting science, but also science that requires a lot of modern technology. And I'd like to illustrate that with two examples. One is the search for exoplanets, Earths like ours, but elsewhere in the galaxy or in the universe. And the first galaxies in the universe. And then I'd like to show you two of probably the most challenging future projects. Really huge, big, expensive telescopes that are not operating now, that are being planned, one is being built, but they will be operating in the next decade and then deliver results on many things, but hopefully also on exoplanets and galaxies. Okay, so this is our program for tonight. So let me start with an overview of the revolution or evolution in telescopes. And the telescope is, of course, an optical instrument. It collects light, there are radio telescopes, but I will only talk about optical telescopes tonight. And if we talk about optics, I think, uh, the first physicist and mathematician who tried to understand optics systematically was a scientist in, in, uh, born in Basra and, and then uh, lived in Cairo, named uh, Ibn al-Haytham. 
name, famous under the name Alhasen, and he made significant contributions to the principle of optics. Made contributions to astronomy and also established the scientific method, what it means to do scientific measurements. Of course, some ideas were already brought up by, by the Greek philosophers, Aristoteles, for example, but this was mostly arguing and, and ideas. But Alhasen was really the first one who applied scientific methods to measure things, and he carried out various experiments with lenses, with mirrors, tested refraction and reflection. And so it was really important in our understanding of geometric optics. Then later, of course, in the midst of uh, the, uh, this millennium, uh, lenses were, of course, important as devices that magnified the light, but mostly, of course, as lenses that helped humans to have a better eyesight. Right, so they're essentially glasses, like this one. And uh, those lenses were already known in the first millennium, in fact. But the spectacles with one polished surface, we're then making a spherical polished surface with a known curvature that helped really give people better uh, eyesight. Those were available in the 13th century. But the useful area was typically only about a centimeter squared, so relatively small. And of course, there were many studies in Europe in the 16th centuries uh, to improve the optics, and the theory was not a problem in to, to build a magnifying glass. Magnify back then, of course, it was called a magnifying glass, but this is what we now consider a telescope. And the theory was not a problem. People knew you had to, to combine a convex lens that is rather strongly curved, with a concave lens that was relatively small curvature. But the problem were the polishing techniques at the time. So it was simply was not possible to get a good surface quality of these, mirror, of these lenses. And so in the early 17th, 17th century, many people were working on a magnifying glass. The invention of the telescope is not something that suddenly was an idea of an individual human being. Many people, especially in Europe, worked on, on many different uh, ideas, but it was a Dutch lens maker named Hans Leberhey who had the idea to stop down, meaning you just make the, the light beam smaller uh, somewhere in the optics, and he stopped it down from three centimeters to one centimeter. In principle, a very tri trivial thing. You take big lenses, but you make them smaller at some point by just inserting a mask. And suddenly, the image became much sharper. And so, in, on the 25th of September, 1608, so that's one month to go, and then we can celebrate uh, 405 years of, of this invention. And of course, that's a long time back. I have heard that uh, Antioquia has been independent now for 200 years. So this is always twice as, as long in the past. And he presented his invention, or his spy glasses, to the Prince Maurice of Nassau uh, in The Hague. They denied him the patent because at first they were afraid that these spy glasses could be used by their enemies of the Netherlands uh, and then spy the Dutch ships too early on the sea. So he was not given the patent, but they gave him a lot of money and ordered more copies for their ships and their army. But then in October 1608, they wrote a diplomatic newsletter and uh, that was printed and distributed so that, that people, other people also learned about this uh, interesting invention. And this newsletter also reached Galileo Galilei in Italy. Just half a year later, in early 1609, and he immediately recognized the importance of this invention and built his own telescope. So Lippahey provided the optics, but he actually was just looking on the ground, spying. Galileo was the first one to take it and look at the sky. 
and with a 20-fold magnification and four times more light collecting area with the human eye, he made many inventions. So he discovered mountains on the surface of moon, he discovered the satellites of Jupiter, and he wrote up all these discoveries in a book that he published in 1610, and this book of course made Galileo famous. So this is all just within two years after the telescope went around the world. So of course he became famous, and this picture we see that he presented his telescope to the Doge of Venice, showed him how to use the telescope, but you can also see that the telescope, compared to what we know now, is fairly small in diameter. Right? Probably nice to spot what's happening in another building in Venice, but it had its limitations. And the limitations were that with only four times the collecting area, 20 times the magnification, the discovery potential of Galileo's first telescope was quickly exhausted, meaning there were no really new interesting objects within the reach of this new instrument. And then Johannes Kepler, a German astronomer, improved the optical performance of Galileo's telescope by changing the optics a bit. He used two convex lenses. So here on the left we'll see Galileo's telescope with the two lenses that I described before. You have a... Oops. You have a convex lens here. The, the light is coming here from the sky. The light will be uh, focused here, but then it's diverged in again. And with this eyepiece here, then you have essentially the magnification is the difference between the large beam where you collect a lot of light and then the, uh, all that information hits the eye in a smaller beam, so it's compressed and that uh, makes it more sensitive. And Kepler's idea was to actually move that lens around and use another convex lens here. And by doing so, there were more degrees of freedom, he had more, more lenses to choose from, and overall he could improve uh, the performance of the telescope. But it were small, still small lens telescopes, and it took until uh, a year later, essentially, until Isaac Newton in England took up the idea, but developed the first reflecting telescope. So in his uh, telescope now, we see the light coming from the sky here, entering this tube, and at the end here, there is a mirror that focuses the light in this direction. There's a small flat mirror here that redirects the light uh, orthogonal in the, uh, to the beam in the other direction. And here we have an eyepiece, meaning that here we can look and we will see an image of the telescope. Right, so this was the invention of the eyepiece and the Newtonian telescope. Now, the advantage of that is that mirrors can be made much larger, but they're more difficult to polish than lenses. Lenses are, in principle, easy to polish. You just need a block of glass, and you need another, another reference sphere, and you just move them randomly with respect to each other, and at the end of the day, you have two very nice spherical surfaces. That's not so easily doable with mirrors, and Newton himself, at some point, described that the art of polishing of mirrors will be better learned by practice than by my description. <coughs> and then, of course, there was a whole industry of people who were uh, polishing lenses and mirrors, and the telescopes kept on growing. Here in this figure, we see the four-foot, 1.2 meter refractor, uh, that was uh, assembled in 1789 and designed by Sir William Herschel, a German-British uh, scientist, astronomer. But you can see here that there is a limit reached now. The telescope, it's not just the telescope optics that's the problem here, it's also the mount of the telescope. It's a gigantic, massive tube, and you have to point it on the sky, and you have to continuously move it, and you probably I do not know, but I imagine you probably heard the wooden posts cracking and squeaking and uh, when the telescope was moving. 
So that was essentially the end of big telescope in the 18th, uh, in the, uh, 18th century. But telescopes kept on growing when steel constructions became available, more uh, modern polishing techniques. And here I'll show you just a few telescopes of the early 20th century that have become very famous. And of course, the maybe arguably the most famous is the Mount Wilson telescope, the 100-inch telescope, where, which was at the, the center of discoveries in the earliest 20th century. Discoveries like uh, galaxies, like, uh, uh, well, I think I'll leave it at the galaxies for now, but you can see that the telescope was also visited by, by famous uh, theoreticians here, who did, of course, never do really observations themselves, but here we see Albert Einstein visiting and uh, uh, asking Edwin Hubble if his ideas about uh, uh, the universe are actually in agreement with uh, the observations. And then the next step was to double the size of the telescope, to build the 200-inch or 5-meter Hale telescope on Paloma Mountain in California, so not far from the Mount Wilson telescope, which is just above uh, Los Angeles. So if you you can you can easily see it from Los Angeles if there is no smog. The Hale telescope is a bit further in the forests of California. And there are even refractors have been uh, built, like the one meter Yerkes refractor that is still occasionally being used. But you can also see that there was a limit in terms of size. I mean, imagine this is this is a huge dome that is necessary to host this. Uh, this telescope, the Yerkes refractor. And it's overall, the telescope itself is relatively small, but you have this huge building around. And now imagine if you would build it, which is technically not possible to build a 10 meter lens telescope, but if it were, well, you have to scale it up and it would be much larger than any stadium or any, any building on Earth. So something had to be done. And there were a lot of technical inventions that led to a new generation of telescopes. And unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into the individual contributions that technology made for those telescopes. But famous one here, for example, is the Keck telescope on Mauna Kea, a volcano on, on the islands of Hawaii. Another one is the very large telescope, the VLT on Cerro Paranal in Chile which is actually a constellation of four telescopes. And here is another one, the Large Binacular Telescope on Mount Graham in Arizona. And, well, you can see from the picture why it's called the Large Binacular, point, large binocular Telescope. It moves two mirrors at the same time and gives much sharper images than a single telescope. So the telescopes have been growing, but there were also dream telescopes, telescopes that never made it. Here we see an example of a Russian telescope that was on the cover of a newspaper that was proposed in 1952. Very nice, you can see it in the snowy mountains here, and there's a big valley, and across the valley is the axis of the telescope. Okay, that, that was a dream. Here is another one by George Ritchie who had a, a strong role in some of the other American telescopes. And he proposed, in 1929, an 8-meter telescope at the edge of the Grand Canyon. He was probably inspired uh, during his vacations or so. I mean, it's a beautiful sight to have this telescope there, but it's an awful observing sight, because there's all the, the hot valley, uh, sorry, the hot air coming from the valley of the Grand Canyon. So there will be a lot of turbulence in the air, and you will have very fuzzy images. And not surprisingly, this telescope was never built. There were other ideas, like this was an idea for the, for the Universal Exhibition in Paris at the, at the turn of the century, where you had a two-meter uh, refractor here, no, well, a two-meter, uh, such as just a reflecting mirror. So you were, you were looking at the sky, and then you reflected this light into a long tube that was on rails, and this tube contained uh, yeah, lens telescopes. And I think, I think that part was built, and that part was never built. Just impractical, too expensive, but 
Telescope making at some point was, was also fashionable, not just for a few astronomy geeks, it was also a challenge for, for the, what you can do after the Industrial Revolution in terms of putting big steel constructions together and impressing everyone by perfect images. So if we look how the telescope sizes have increased with time, well, we can do this by, by looking at the collecting area of the telescopes, how, how big they are in, 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 in area of the primary mirror, essentially, as a function of the time. So here we see the year from 1600 uh, to today. And you can see this increase here. That's not just increasing like every year it gets a bit bigger. That's a typical exponential uh, growth, meaning that it does not grow by the same amount every year, but in fact the diameter doubled every 35 years. We know a similar scaling law from the speed of the computers that we're all using. Where we say the speed of the computer, actually I don't know about it, it's called Moore's law, doubles every, what is it, some, maybe someone knows every... 1.8. 1.8 years, thank you, Parker. And uh, we see something similar here for telescopes. So every 35 years, the telescopes have doubled. And of course, that, uh, that uh, change was also helped by new technologies uh, that, um, like photographic plates, CCDs for the detectors, more sensitive detectors, powerful computers to help to control the telescope keep it in shape, keep it aligned. And so that helped that we now can actually build bigger and bigger telescopes. And of course the question is, why do astronomers always want bigger telescopes? Right? Is it just that we're, uh, that we're not happy with what we already have? <laughs> no, there are, for discovery there are two essential components. Why a telescope has to be big. One is the sensitivity. A larger telescope simply collects more light and can see fainter objects. Right? Remember Galileo's telescope, where you had only four times the area of the human eye. So obviously he could not see many faint objects. If you have a big telescope dish, you can collect a lot of light. And interestingly, the time it takes to detect a faint star to see a faint star in a, in a short exposure, that time is not proportional simply to the telescope diameter. Now it, it is shorter by the fourth power of the time, of the, sorry, of the telescope uh, diameter. So let, let me give you an example of what I mean. Essentially, if you had a 39 meter telescope, I'll show you in the third part of my talk, an example of what astronomers plan to build. If you had such a 39 meter telescope, then this would correspond to about 900 years of exposure on a one meter telescope. Right? Now, I mean, typically you expose for a night, maybe, maybe a few nights, but no one, of course, can take an image for 900 years. So it is clear that you simply will not be able to have access to some objects in the universe, some of the most interesting objects in the universe, if you only had a small telescope. So that's the sensitivity. And the other main component, or the argument to have bigger telescope, is the angular resolution. A larger telescope produces sharper images. Sharper images means you see more details. You can see more structure of the object that you're looking at. And this angular resolution is, again, depending on the telescope diameter. And just as an example, again, let's, let's imagine we had this 39-meter telescope in Medellin. And we look to Bogota. And someone holds up a newspaper. I know there are mountains and forests in between. It's not so easy. <laughs> but let's just imagine someone is holding up a newspaper in Bogota you would be able to see the headline. You would be able to resolve structures of less than a centimeter over the distance between Medellin and Bogota. 
Okay, so the sensitivity and the angular resolution are directly coupled to the telescope diameter. And to give you another example why angular resolution is so important, maybe I should first say that the unit that astronomers use, not just astronomers, but mainly astronomers, to measure an angle, a very tiny angle, is the arc second. And one arc second is the angle that a human hair has seen from 10 meters. So if someone in the back now pulls out a hair and holds it in the air, thank you, then I can, I can, the size, the angular size of that hair would correspond to an arc second. This is much better than what you can see with your human eye. So with the eye you only have 60 arc seconds. So it's 60 times worse, or you had to hold 60 hairs next to each other, and then you could see them, maybe. A telescope like I, sh I will show you at the end will provide 0 0.003 arc seconds resolution. So that, that would be a three thousandth of the width of that hair that you would be able to see. And the, in the resolution is so important to study many objects in the sky. For those of you who had been to uh, Elena Rossi's talk on uh, Tuesday night, she talked about the galactic center. And she showed beautiful images of the galactic center. So I'll just show you two images here in comparison. The left one is the galactic center region with only one arc second resolution, which you can get for a, no a standard telescope on a good observing site. But if you increase the resolution by a factor of 20, if you make it 20 times better, and we don't have to discuss now how you do that, but then you get what you see on the right image. Then you see suddenly all the stars that are circling around the black hole. And then you can start to study that region in the center of our galaxy. But the angular resolution is key to understanding what's happening there. And so we need big telescopes. We need to see faint objects, and we need to see their very sharp images. And how we get there, we'll see soon, but I think now I should give Jorge a chance to translate. Thank you. Okay. Bueno, vamos a hacer el ejercicio simplemente, en un minuto, de revisar los puntos más importantes hasta ahora. Creo que el profesor ha tenido la, digamos, decencia de hablarnos bastante tratando de que sea bastante entendible. El primer elemento, digamos, importante para resaltar es la idea de que vamos a hablar solamente de telescopios ópticos en la charla. Eh, también eh, nos habló sobre la historia del telescopio y para resaltar la idea de que las lentes con las que se hacen los telescopios llegaron en el primer milenio a Europa. No fue el trabajo de un solo individuo, que es algo que se piensa normalmente cuando se habla de la historia del telescopio. Fue Hans Lieberhead, un eh, digamos, constructor de lentes holandés, quien fue el primero en presentar la idea del telescopio, pero la patente no se le fue otorgada y la información sobre la construcción del telescopio, de, de, su, de, de, de su dispositivo llegó o se distribuyó por Europa y llegó a manos de Galileo. Interesante también, lo mencionaba el profesor, el telescopio de Galileo en realidad era un telescopio que tenía una magnificación de 20, que es la magnificación típica que tiene unos binoculares de la casa. Solo tenía un tamaño de alrededor de cuatro veces el tamaño de la pupila humana, comparado con 39 metros del que nos hablaba al final. Kepler mejoró el telescopio eh, al poner dos lentes convexas en vez de una convexa y una cóncava, que era lo que utilizaba Galileo. Después llegó el telescopio de Newton, que era un telescopio hecho de espejos. Los telescopios de espejos se pueden hacer más grandes, de mayor tamaño, pero más difíciles de pulir. Después tuvo la oportunidad de hablarnos que los telescopios, una vez hechos de espejos, empezaron a crecer, y nos mostró el telescopio refle eh, eh, reflector de Sir William Herschel, de 1789, 
en ese telescopio montado sobre andamios de madera y él nos hablaba de que te imaginaba cuando movía en ese telescopio cómo sonarían todos esos pedazos de madera y, acá. y e inmediatamente pasamos a los telescopios de principios del siglo XX donde nos mostró el fantástico telescopio Hale de Monte Palomar en el que él ha trabajado y el también histórico refractor Jerkis en este punto el profesor dio una información bastante importante y es que mmm, al punto en el que llegamos en el principio del siglo XX con el telescopio Jerkes, si se querían construir telescopios más grandes, los domos tenían que ser del tamaño de un estadio. Entonces, eh, digamos, allá aparecieron las novedades de los telescopios modernos del siglo XX. Y en esta última parte nos estuvo hablando entonces de los telescopios de ensueño que habían a principios del siglo XX, entre ellos este que iban a construir en el en el Cañón del Colorado y dijo algo muy importante en esta escrita de la diapositiva es que es un mal lugar para observar el Cañón del Colorado para que si alguien estaba pensando en construir el telescopio no se puede por el aire caliente que sale del, 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 del desierto aquí también tenemos un proyecto para construir un telescopio en el desierto nos mostró cómo ha crecido exponencialmente el tamaño de los telescopios aumentando o doblándose en tamaño aproximadamente cada 35 años y finalmente nos explicó entonces cuáles son las ventajas de tener telescopios cada vez más grandes. Primero, la sensibilidad. Nos explicó que la sensibilidad, la capacidad de coger luz de un telescopio no depende de su diámetro, sino que depende en realidad del de diámetro elevado a la cuarta potencia, o el diámetro por el diámetro por el diámetro por el diámetro. De manera que un telescopio de un metro tomaría en no le tomaría 900 años para tomar una fotografía de la misma calidad que uno de 39 metros. Y la segunda ventaja es la resolución angular o la capacidad de distinguir ángulos muy pequeños, eh, donde nos mostraba entonces que mmm, si utilizáramos el telescopio de 39 metros que, van, que, es, que se va a construir para observar desde Medellín, pues, subiéndolo por las montañas, a Bogotá seríamos capaces de ver los titulares del tiempo desde esta distancia, pero puestos en un periódico en Bogotá. Y en la imagen que nos mostró finalmente, nos mostró entonces cómo eh, la resolución angular es fundamental para poder ver, por ejemplo, el centro de la galaxia. También es importante la explicación que nos dio sobre lo que es un segundo de arco, que va a venir seguramente a lo que cuento a continuación, un arc sec, o un segundo de arco, que equivale al grosor de un cabello puesto a, la distancia, a una distancia de aproximadamente 10 metros, y que el ojo humano puede tener una resolución de aproximadamente 60 veces eso, es decir, nosotros solamente podemos ver 60 cabellos humanos a la distancia de 10 metros. Pero la foto que nos mostró tenía una resolución de un tres milavo de un cabello visto a 10 metros. Muchas gracias. Ok, ahora vamos a ver qué puedes hacer con los telescopios más grandes. And again, as I said before, there are plenty of things astronomers can think of, but maybe the two most exciting endeavors are, of course, looking for exoplanets. Are there other worlds in the universe like ours? And finding the first galaxies in the universe to understand how the universe evolved as a whole and how the structure in galaxies was built up. So let me start with exoplanets. And, of course, philosophers have been arguing about exoplanets. Aristotle, for example, he thought that there cannot be more worlds than one. Basically for the same reason why people have been believing that the Earth must be in the center and the Sun must be orbiting around the Earth. But there are other philosophers, like Epicurus, who around the same time argue that there are infinite worlds, both like ours and unlike ours. And not much happened since then, for 2,000 years, until in 1992, a planet was found by accident, more or less. It was discovered around the pulsar, because it left a very interesting signature on the observation of that pulsar. And then in 1995, a planet named 51 Pegasi b was detected, also by a special method. And let me say one, uh, or show you one more graph. 
it shows the rate of exoplanet discovery. So on here you just see the number of planets that have been found as a function of the time. Right? We said 1995 was the time the first planets were found. And then again, it also started to take off around here. So hunting for planets is a relatively new science, and it takes off here. The interesting thing here is, well, you see that there are four curves. Right? <laughs> it's brown one, dark blue, light blue, yellow. And each curve shows a different method of detection. It's not that you just look somewhere and you see a planet. They're very hard to spot, and I'll show you in a minute why. But these are different methods and techniques to look for them. And the yellow curve and the blue curve, radial velocities and transits, that's the name for these special techniques that, that astronomers use, they're indirect detections, in a sense. So we, what do I mean with that? Okay, let's just look for interest for, for just one example, the transits here. We know now hundreds of planets, and this is, a, this is an illustration that was made based on observations with the Kepler satellite. And of course, you don't see the real planets, you just see some graphics, some animation of planetary systems that people have found. I can show it again. And so the size of the planet, like this one here is a really big one, just illustrates its mass. If there are more dots orbiting, that means that planetary system has more than was just one planet, probably multiple ones. And the colors are not relevant. But it shows you that, and here the, the, the size also reflects the mass of the star. And so we know by now many planets in the, in, around other stars. Okay? So planets are common in the universe. The planets are common in our Milky Way. But the way the planets were found is the following. Let's assume you look at a star, a stellar system somewhere, and the planets orbit in the same plane as you look at them. So then you have a transit. At some point, the planets will cross the disk of the star. And the star is bright and shiny, and the planet is not. So if you record the light of the star, you will see a small dip in the light curve. So this, the star will become a bit fainter, simply because the planet is obscuring the light between the star and us. So you see, right? we receive less light from the star. And that must be, if it happens regularly, that means there must be something orbiting. So we see that. But of course, we don't really see the planet. Right? We only know there must be something, and what else shall it be? So these planets have all been discovered via occultations, and similar things apply to the other method that is producing lots of planets that we know the radial velocities. But the, the one technique, for example, here, direct imaging, that's the, the purple or dark blue curve here at the bottom. You can see it's, it's still after, after 15 years, still very low numbers. Direct imaging means you take a picture and you see the planet directly. And we still have seen only very, very few of the planets. And why is that? Why is it so hard to see planets? Well, this is just the graph that shows, with the sun in the middle, the neighborhood of the sun, of our sun. So out to a volume in space of about four light years. This is by even galactic standards. That's nothing nearby. A tiny fraction of the galaxy and a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the universe. So that's why we call it in a neighborhood. But even when you do, and you have three major problems. The one pro first problem is that the planets you'd like to see are intrinsically faint. Yeah, I mean, you can go out there at day and you see the sun, this is no problem. But if you go at night, it will be hard to spot immediately Jupiter or even Uranus or something like that. The planets are faint, and the sun is bright. 
And unfortunately, they're very close together. They have a very small separation on the sky. And so even if we just look at the closest stars in our local universe, only the ones that are as far away as the light takes to travel in four years, the separation, let's take the separation of our solar system the, the, between the Earth and the Sun, is just a quarter arc second apart. And remember, when we, made it, when we said you have to put a hair there, that's one arc second. So the, the, it corresponds about to human hair seen from 10 meters distance. So this is a really tiny angle, and now we don't need to only see to resolve that angle, but we also have the problem that there is the star in the image that outshines the planet that we need to resolve. And the challenge, of course, is to get rid of the light of the star. This is an image of a star cluster taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, which in terms of sharp imaging is still the shape of the Earth. And you see that all of the stars here, bright stars, have a huge halo around. And this halo is much bigger than this 0.25 arc seconds where we want to see the planet. So here is the star, and our planet is probably here. Yeah? And it's completely flooded with the light from the star in our observations as we can see them. Now, of course, in principle, this the planet should be seen there. So let's say this is the light profile of the star. So if you would just measure it, yeah, measure it across here, you would get the profile of the star. And what you want to see is maybe there's a little up there, a little peak that indicates there is something else. But the problem is this contrast problem. I mean, this is a, this is of course a very nice case, right? The planet here, I mean, we can measure it, that's about a fifth or a quarter of the, head, of the height of the star, right? So we can measure a, con a so-called contrast here, just the, the ratio between the planet and the star brightness. The problem is, if we look even at the contrast brightness, let's say we take a spaceship and we travel away from the solar system, and then we look back at our solar system, and then we observe the Sun and Jupiter. And Jupiter is a big planet, it's relatively bright. But the Sun still is a thousand million times brighter than Jupiter. So that will be hard to find. And finding a Jupiter next to the Sun, to show an example, that's why I showed Mount Everest here, yeah, you've probably been wondering all along, what, why should I show the mountain? Just to give an idea what this contrast means of, of one billion or one to a thousand millions, if you had the height of Mount Everest, and you put, that's reflecting the light of our star, this mountain, right? This is our measured light curve. And now we want to find a planet next to Mount Everest. So we want to put something there that is a billion times fainter, or in this example, a billion times smaller. Yeah? That would be a red blood cell. Of course, this is exaggerated. Right? But imagine you put really a red blood cell somewhere on the slopes of Mount Everest, then the ratio between the size of this blood cell to the height of the mountain, that's essentially the ratio between the brightness of Jupiter and the Sun. And if, of course, if you look from far away, this is the challenge you have to overcome. And as I said, Jupiter is bright, the Earth would be even smaller and fainter. So it would be only a little part of the blood cell. So that makes it really hard. So is it hopeless? Shall we give up? No. Many uh, smart people have been worrying about these issues. And if you use a combination of several things, like superb optical instruments, special observing and calibration techniques, you include some spectroscopy, polarimetry, and maybe most importantly, use the biggest telescopes you can have then maybe it can be done. But this is still something we have to prove, at least for planets that are like Jupiter or the Earth. And you want to say something first? 
Ok, esto es más, más rápido. Quería aquí resaltar de lo que acaba de explicar mi profesor, entonces, los tres grandes problemas de encontrar un exoplaneta, que esencialmente son la debilidad, es demasiado débil, está demasiado cerca a su estrella y la estrella es demasiado brillante. Entonces, eh, vieron la eh, analogía que colocaba el profesor, quiero aclararla, la idea es, imagínense que el monte Everest es del tamaño de la cantidad de luz que nos llega a la Tierra de la estrella. No es que el monte Everest sea del tamaño de la estrella, sino que el monte Everest es una medida de cuánta luz llega de la estrella. Si colocáramos a esa escala la cantidad de luz que nos llega de un planeta del tamaño de Júpiter, que es supuestamente el grandulón, entonces la cantidad de luz a esa misma escala que nos llegaría de Júpiter sería la de un, el, el, del tamaño de un glóbulo rojo, comparado con el monte Everest. Y la Tierra, obviamente, mucho más pequeña, sería una pequeña parte de lo que es un glóbulo rojo. Entonces, el reto es bastante eh, eh, grande. Como vieron también en la imagen del telescopio espacial Hubble, que como les decía el profesor, es hasta ahora lo mejorcito que tenemos, eh, al tomar una foto de la estrella con los mejores instrumentos, el halo que rodea la estrella no nos permite ver entonces exactamente eh, el planeta. Entonces la pregunta es si estamos, si esto no tiene ninguna esperanza y la verdad es que sí hay esperanza si se usa una combinación de buenos instrumentos ópticos, buenas eh, técnicas eh, espectrales y otras técnicas, digamos, instrumentales. Ok, let me now start with the second example, which is the first galaxy. And of course, people have been wondering about galaxies, like the philosopher Immanuel Kant. He speculated that there might be island universes just like our own in the, in the, in the universe, in the midst of the 18th century. And it is interpreted with our knowledge that we have now as he was the sort of the first one to speculate about other galaxies. But then it took another almost 200 years until the early uh, 1920s when Edwin Hubble and others, the collaboration of more people, although Edwin Hubble usually is credited, they established the existence of island universes at the 100-inch telescope of Mount Wilson, one of the telescopes I've been showing you before. So, and, of course, these were all the telescope, sorry, the galaxies that are close to us. The first ones that were found, obviously. But if we look briefly at the history of the cosmic evolution, this is the standard picture that astronomers and physicists have of the universe, how it evolved. It all started with the Big Bang here, and no one, at least no astronomer or physicist knows what's happened here. But we can calculate back to pretty close to that point what happened and what was going on. So soon after the Big Bang, there must have been a gigantic expansion, often referred to as inflation, that blew up the universe extremely quickly to a considerable fraction of the size it has today. And that went well, in, in fractions of a second, which is hard to imagine. And I don't expect you to understand what's happening here. And I would say that most astronomers don't understand what happened here. So this is only a picture, and you can calculate many things, but it's not really like we have a sense of understanding. But we can explain it mathematically, and we can see with observations how well our models and explanation actually fit the observations. So then, at this point, whatever matter was there in the universe from the Big Bang, well, that cooled, that's called the Dark Ages, and at some point, matter got denser and denser, and the first stars have formed, and the first galaxies have formed. And from then on, the universe kept on expanding slowly. And we think nowadays 
that the universe is not only expanding, it's actually accelerating an expansion. But this would be the topic for another talk. This was the, the Nobel Prize was awarded for that discovery uh, just a few years ago. But in this universe here, from somewhere after a few million years, for most of the time until now, there are galaxies. Galaxies like the Milky Way. But they're, they're almost living organisms in the sense that the galaxies we observe today are not like the galaxies that were born in the early universe. So the galaxies evolved. Some collided with each other. Some grew in size by other means. In any case, if we want to know more about what's happened and how the universe has evolved, we would like to look back in time. We would look to like back in time some 13 million years at least to see how these first universe uh, galaxies looked like. Now, of course, there are also people who do numerical simulations, make some assumptions about what this, this soup of matter was in the early days. And here are just some snapshots from these simulations. Of course, these are not observations. This is just what people have created on their computers. But now then, with these images, or with these simulations, now we have a means to compare it with observations if we have powerful enough telescopes. So this is how the universe might have looked like after 210 million years. After a, a billion years, a thousand million years, so you already see the structure evolving, getting higher contrast, meaning there is more matter now in smaller areas, after 4.7 billion years, and how it would look today in these simulations. And now we want to look back and see, really, by observing galaxies, and how the galaxies are distributed in space, whether that matches what we know what we think we know. And so we have to hunt for the first galaxies. This is a beautiful, sorry, this one. This is a beautiful image taken with the Hubble Space Telescope of a cluster of galaxies. The universe is full of galaxies, right? They're beautiful. There are billions of galaxies. And because the universe is expanding and we can look back in time, some of them are, are very early galaxies. But we have to spot them. And so people are looking. There is a, like, like the hunt for exoplanets, there is a hunt for the first galaxies. This is an image. This is, again, another image of the Hubble Space Telescope. And so you, if you zoom in in this little square, you get this image. And if you zoom in here in the center, you see a little red source there. Right? This is not my laser. There's a little red source there. If you zoom in further, this is what you get. And people have uh, found out that this dim object is probably a compact galaxy which was created only 400, or formed only 480 million years after the Big Bang. The problem is this is that this galaxy is already about 10,000 million times fainter than what you can see with your bare eye. I think now you can believe me that you need a telescope. <laughs> and this galaxy isn't even the very first object that has formed, because the very first objects are expected to have certain signatures. We know how they should look like, roughly. This doesn't really look like that, and it's probably not the first object. So we have to go even further and see if we can find the very earliest object in the universe. So the future in astronomy may mean we look back in time, even further. And one telescope that will, can, will be able to do that is the Webb Space Telescope. And people expect it to look back to approximately 275 million years after the Big Bang, which is only 2% of the current age of the universe. So this is really the, the baby phase of our universe. And maybe even beyond. And it would be very surprising if there would not be many discoveries once this telescope is working. And I'll show you. The, uh, yeah. And uh, I'll tell you about these telescopes in a minute. But I 
think Jorge wants to do a quick translation. Ok, creo que todo ha sido muy bien ilustrado, pero esencialmente quiero resaltar la historia del universo porque es a eso a lo que le apuntan los instrumentos en los que está trabajando el profesor y que vamos a hablar en esta parte final de la conferencia. Eh, el detalle más importante es entonces, estamos tratando de mirar los primeros objetos del universo, el profesor nos ilustraba cómo evolucionó el universo desde el Big Bang, eh, pasando por una etapa que él nos contaba, ni los astrónomos saben qué fue lo que pasó exactamente, hasta llegar aproximadamente unos 100 millones de años después del Big Bang, cuando comenzaron a formarse las galaxias. Y nos insistía mucho en el hecho de que las galaxias son los objetos, digamos, más importantes, básicamente, que hay en el universo. Nosotros lo llamamos aquí los ladrillos del universo, y que son objetos que evolucionan en el tiempo. Después tuvo la oportunidad de mostrarnos algunas instantáneas de cómo se estudia la evolución de las galaxias a través de simulaciones hechas por computador. El dato que nos daba, también es muy interesante, era que eh, esta pequeña galaxia, se veía como una manchita chiquita observada por el Hubble, es aproximadamente 10.000 millones de veces más débil de lo que podemos observar por, con el ojo humano, y eh, nos contaba, nos decía que eh, tal vez después de eso pensemos que efectivamente necesitamos un telescopio, si, si ese es el brillo. Eh, el futuro entonces de la astronomía está en el James Webb Telescope que va a ser capaz de ver eh, atrás en el tiempo posiblemente hasta aproximadamente 275 millones de años después del Big Bang. Okay, now let me come to the third part of this presentation, and this is, uh, I'd like to give you a flavor of two of these telescope projects that we think can address some of these science questions, the James Webb Telescope and the European Extremely Large Telescope. Let me, let me start with the James Webb Telescope. There's an image here showing, showing this, this uh, fantastic future telescope. And it will be essentially the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope that we, I think, we all have heard of and, and uh, appreciate all the, the great pictures that it has produced. The James Webb Space Telescope will be built by an international collaboration of about 17 countries. The whole uh, endeavor is led by NASA, who puts in most of the money. But there is also contribution from ESA and Canada. And it will, it will not look at optical light so much than in the infrared, because there is also, the, in, the light gets redder and redder if we look further back in time, and so it's optimized for observations at higher redshift. It is actually named, because few people, Hubble, most people have heard about, maybe a few people have heard about James Webb, he was actually the second NASA administrator who had a great impact in, in making the Apollo program to put people on the moon a success. And now this is the <laughs> noticeable point, maybe. It's not for free. <laughs> okay. So let me show you. This is just a, a small fraction of the mirror. The mirrors are segmented. It will have a six and a half meter mirror. So that would just fit in here. And the mirror is made of segments, has a collecting area of 25 square meters, it's made of 16 hexagonal segments. And the telescope will have a big sun shield. And I'll show you why this is necessary. And the sun shield itself is a very impressive technical thing. It's very imp important to keep the light from the sun away because we want to have a very sensitive telescope. Now, of course, If it were on Earth, right, we just wait till night, till the Earth rotates, and then the Earth will shield the light from the sun. If we put it in space, we have to shield the sun somehow in some other way. And the sun shields they have developed has the size of a tennis court. And so we, it will always, the, the telescope will be on the side, some, some side away from the sun. Here would be the sun, and there is the sun shield. And the sun shield, I'll show you a picture in a, in a few seconds. It will actually cool the telescope from essentially 85 degrees, which is the temperature out there in space where the telescope will be placed, to minus 233 uh, sorry, uh, degrees Celsius. And it will reduce the impact from the sun, which is 300 kilowatts. 
right? That's whatever, 300 washing machines uh, on the whole surface to, to only 23 milliwatts. So that means that this layer of, of uh, this sun shield will reduce the, the flux from the sun by about 13 million times. And of course, if it's not working, the telescope will be too warm and will be useless. So this is a model of the sun shield. Not only that, it also shows there are, well, it shows many things. There are many people working on the project. And it's big. This is, of course, not the real telescope. But in NASA has built an, a one-to-one -one model and is going from, from exhibition to exhibition with that to show people how big it is. And this is the sun shield, where we said this has the size of a tennis court. And there are actually five layers. Now, again, remember, this is about 20 meters from here to here. The telescope mirror here is six and a half meters. And then, of course, the question is, how do you get this up in space? I couldn't resist to show this image. <laughs> so how do we get this in space? Well, first of all, it will be launched from Kourou in French Guyana, and it's foreseen to launch it in 2018 on an Ariane 5 lock rocket that will be provided by the European Space Agency. And it will be located at, uh, in, in an orbit that is called an Earth-Sun Lagrangian point. It is essentially at 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth. So here's the Sun, here is the Earth, here is the Moon, and the James Webb Space, Space Telescopes will be placed here. But we have not figured out yet how to put a 20 meter object in space, because the rocket which is shown here, obviously is smaller. So you have to fold the mirror and the sunshade. It does not fit, so you have to fold it up. And I'll show you how, how NASA engineers believe this will happen. So we, we send it, fold it together, this big thing. We send it up with an Ariane 5 rocket in space. And once it's in space, it will start to unfold. So first you have to fold out solar panels, which are very important, because otherwise you run out of battery, and then you don't have any communication anymore. And then these are the supports for the sun shields. These are very thin layers uh, of some foil. Telescope gets further pushed out. Now we open the, the little foils of the sun sheet. They also, of course, have to be separated. If they're sticking together, they will not give us our 13 million times reduction of the sunlight. So they have to be really isolated layers. Now it's all pushing out. Remember, this is all happening 1.5 million kilometers from Earth. So if this doesn't work, it will be very hard to there is no light for the Hubble Space Telescope, where they send astronauts there to, uh, to repair it. And the Hubble Space Telescope was orbiting the Earth. This is way too far away. So this better works. There is no second chance. Unfold the mirror. And you have the six and a half meter telescope in space. And of course, in its remote location and this cool environment far away from the Earth, it will be ideal to be very sensitive looking back in time to uh, look for the first galaxies. But maybe I should continue with the... Or... If I can. Yeah, well, okay. Okay, un par de puntos importantes que yo quisiera, porque algunas cosas, pues, digamos, en inglés son difíciles de seguir. La primera es que un telescopio que va a trabajar principalmente en el infrarrojo, como lo vieron, esto es importante resaltarlo, porque los objetos que están muy lejos están, se ven muy más rojos por efectos de la expansión eh, del universo. Vieron el costo aproximadamente 8 mil millones de dólares, 8 billones 
en inglés es 8 mil millones de dólares, que es lo que costó más o menos el LHC. Otro elemento importante es este, eh, esta gran protección térmica que tiene para evitar que el calor del sol caliente los instrumentos. Como, como trabajan en, en, en infrarrojo, tienen que estar muy fríos. Entonces esta protección, esta, esta cosa que tiene por debajo es para enfriar los instrumentos. En el caso de la Tierra, lo podemos hacer porque la Tierra misma actúa como nuestra barrera protectora contra eh, el calor del sol. Eh, vieron que va a estar ubicado en aproximadamente, eh, aproximadamente un millón y medio de kilómetros de la Tierra y hay un elemento muy importante que nos explicaba mientras veíamos el video y es el hecho de que mm, el telescopio va a estar demasiado lejos de la Tierra como para repararlo en caso de que algo falle. O sea que estas cosas que ustedes ven que estaban ocurriendo ahí automáticamente tienen que ocurrir solas y si algo falla, no hay tutía. Eso no lo digo. El... Entonces, eh, no es como el, el, el telescopio espacial Hubble que puede ser reparado, este no puede ser reparado por la distancia tan grande a la que se encuentra. And the second project I'd like to show you is the European Extremely Large Telescope. And there are, the Americans are also planning two of this next generation large telescopes. This is not the only one, you should mention that, but this is the one where I am involved, so I'm showing you the one I know most about. Okay, this is the EELT, the European Extremely Large Telescope. And you can see it for, immediately, it's big. And that's why it's called Extremely Large. Here are some people for comparison. It will have a 39 meter mirror. And with the 39 meter mirror, you have more light collection power than with all existing optical and infrared telescopes in the world currently existing taken together. So you can sum up all the telescopes. Their light collecting area is about, about the same as this one with a 39 meter. So it will If things go well, it will see light in 2022. I put a question mark there because things get always slower than expected. And the costs of that will be about 1 billion euros. Now, again, you would say, oh, this is a bargain. It's only 1 billion. You told us the James Webb is 8 billion well, euros, dollars. Okay. But that shows you that building things on the ground is a lot cheaper. You don't have to launch it to space. It make everything foolproof 10 times because you have no chance to repair it. If you do it on the ground, you have a chance to repair it. It's cheaper. It's not cheap, but cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> but, of course, you will have all the problems on the ground. You will have turbulence in the atmosphere. You can only observe half the day, or better cold night. And there are many more reasons why space is superior, but on the other hand, there would be no way that we will, in, the, in, in our lifetimes, put a 39 meter telescope in space. Okay, so this has to be on the ground. And as I said, it's huge, so people make these comparisons. This is the ELT shown in comparison to the, to the uh, great pyramids of Pisa. Another comparison of the ELT comparison to the, to the Colosseum in Rome. If you go to the ESO website, you find all kinds of these comparisons because now all of the member countries at ESO want to have their national symbol seen in comparison to the ELT. And also, you see, if you see the poster, and uh, now we even have a comparison between the ELT and the uh, Park Explorer. Park Explorer. In the poster, in the affiche. <laughs> Have a look at the poster. So the telescope main structure is 2,800 tons. And the dome has indeed the size of a small stadium. So it is big. Let me show a few words about the optics. It's just a look in the telescope from above. Because it is special in the sense that it is not a classical telescope with two mirrors, essentially. One big primary mirror and the secondary mirror on top, because it has now five telescope mirrors, which is illustrated here. Where you have the main primary mirror here, the light gets reflected, 
and then it's the secondary mirror, and then there is a focus in between, and then there's the third mirror here, and the fourth mirror, and the fifth mirror directs it then to a place where the astronomical instruments are. So this is where the astronomers then put their, their cameras and their spectrographs and whatever instruments. And this telescope includes a technique called adaptive optics, which corrects for the atmospheric turbulence. Because if this is not done, all I said before to you about uh, angular resolution, sharp images, fighting exoplanets, forget it. So you really have to correct for the atmospheric turbulence, and this is done with a technique called adaptive optics. And I should also say that in order to build up a, a telescope of 39 meter in diameter, of course, you cannot make this with a single mirror. You have to make it in smaller pieces and put them together. So there are almost 800 segments, each about one and a half meter in size, and relatively thin. And those make up the main mirror. And if you can't imagine how a, 19, uh, a 39 meter mirror looks like with one and a half meter segments, you're not alone. Astronomers also have a problem to imagine that. And that's why the people in ESO, at ESO actually in their backyard, they put some, some uh, paper or cardboard uh, uh, pieces together of the mirror. So this is just on the backyard of ESO in Germany and uh, uh, showing these 700 segments put together to outline how the mirror looks like. So this is of course a simple model in reality, the real mirror, of course, has to be extremely accurately polished. And the segments have to be put together very carefully, so there is no, no offset between the segments. And to illustrate the accuracy to which you have to, to make this mirror uh, to, the, to the shape that, you, uh, that physics requires, if you would scale this mirror up to the size of Columbia, so you just scale up, you polish the mirror, and you want to know how, how, high, how accurate their surface has to be. So you scale it up to the size of Columbia. Then it would be polished to an accuracy that would correspond to about mountains and valleys of a height of one millimeter in Columbia. Okay? So one millimeter, if, if, you, if you polish the country to one millimeter, surface roughness, then you have an equivalent of the quality of the ELT mirror. I do not recommend to do that, though. <laughs> <laughs> so where will it be put? The location of the ELT will be in northern Chile, indicated here. So here is Santiago de Chile, um, and uh, it will be put here in a region which is called the driest desert on Earth on a mountain called Serra Amazonas, And this was also selected because it's not far away from a mountain, Cerro Paranal, where ESO is currently operating their very large telescope. In fact, you can see the one from here. The construction hasn't really started yet, but the road has been built to the mountain. So you can see here the road to the mountain. So the only thing that's left now is, is to put a telescope there. Okay, and then, finally, I'd just like to show you a, a little bit of um, a lively telescope. So, again, keep the scales in mind. Oops. Look at the small peoples in this huge truck, which appears to be tiny with respect to the telescope, and then at night the telescope opens. And then you have the 39 meter tall scope, and you can search for galaxies and hunt for planets. That's the plan. And if things go well, this will be ready in about 10 years from now. So at that point, let me summarize. Like astronomy is an ancient science. It goes back centuries, millennia, but also, astronomy is also a very modern science. And to make progress and discoveries, contemporary astronomy really needs to be at the forefront of technology. None of these telescopes would be possible if it were not with the latest 
in technology, in photonics, in computers, uh, in calculations, in control techniques. All that is, is, uh, in, is full of engineering challenges. And this technology is only becoming available now. So although as, uh, astronomers have been looking at the skies for 400 years, this is the decade of the, the big discoveries now, where we can learn about other worlds and see the first galaxies. And the James Webb Space Telescope and the ELT will certainly play a key role in these discoveries. Uh, when we, maybe in 10 years from now, have another talk here to talk about the exoplanets that we found and, and early galaxies. Thank you. Bueno, algunos puntos interesantes tocados en la última parte de la conferencia y varias eh, chistes que, que aclarar. Entonces, el, teles el telescopio extremadamente grande europeo, que no es el único, pero es en el que él ha trabajado y por eso nos lo presentó, va a costar mil millones de euros, que es un poco más, pues, de mil, no sé, dos mil millones de dólares. Esto es más barato que el JWST, que el telescopio para el Hubble, pero no es barato. Era el primer, primer chiste. Es más barato, pero no es barato. Es más barato que James Webb y la razón es sencilla, porque está obviamente en la Tierra. Eh, también nos mostró entonces una comparación con todos estos monumentos, incluyendo el Explora, que lo pueden ver en el afiche, eh, digamos, del, de, de la conferencia. No va a tener dos, dos espejos como lo, lo tienen la mayoría de los telescopios, uno primario y uno secundario, sino que va a, tonar, va a tener en total cinco espejos. Van a llevar la luz hasta lo que se conoce como el foco. Aproximadamente son 798 espejitos más pequeños que, te, que tienen solamente medio centímetro de grosor. Eh, nos contaba también sobre la precisión con la que debe ser pulido el espejo, con la que deben ser pulidos cada fragmento. Nos hizo una analogía con el tamaño de Colombia. Si el espejo fuera construido con, la mismo, con el mismo diámetro de Colombia, imagínense un espejo de ese tamaño, y fuera pulido con la misma precisión y el mismo cuidado con el que debe pulirse este espejo, al final, después de pulir el espejo, del tamaño de Colombia, la montaña más alta sería de un milímetro. ¿Cierto? Esa es la, la analogía. ¿Eso qué quiere decir? Bueno, ahora cojan el espejo con una montaña de un milímetro y reduzcanlo hasta 39 metros. E imagínense de qué tamaño quedan las montañas. Entonces, la precisión de este espejo no tiene absolutamente ningún precedente y obviamente es tan grande el reto que no nos recomienda a ninguno construirlo. construirlo. El telescopio va a estar ubicado en Cerro Armazones, en el norte de Chile, que es el lugar más seco del mundo, el lugar más seco del mundo. Y finalmente, en el resumen, nos presenta entonces una idea que me parece fundamental y es que este telescopio no podría ser construido sin adelantos, los adelantos tecnológicos del presente, sin mucha ingeniería, hay mucha ingeniería detrás de él. Y eh, bueno, esta va a ser, digamos, eh, una década de, 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 de descubrimientos y seguramente el JWST y el ELT van a jugar un papel fundamental. Bien, entonces, eh, now we will accept some questions from the public, in English or in Spanish. Eh, en, en, anyway. Two questions. Uh, what are the comparative advantages of a 39 meters telescope over a 30 meters telescope, a telescope like GMT or TMT projects? Uh, considering that the first uh, has more dynamic and servo control problems, the first. And second, uh, how to determine the top level requirements for an equipment like METIS or MIRI that will be fully operated 10 years in the future? Uh, okay, well, thank you. Uh, obviously, I have an expert here asking <laughs> in the audience. Uh, well, of course. Um, 
telescopes are always as big as you can afford them or you think you can build them. ESO actually started out with a plan to build a 100 meter telescope with uh, many 8,000 spherical mirrors and it, it turned out that it's impossible to build. So they have come, made it smaller and then it became 42 meters and, and no one knew, really knew why 42 and it's now a bit cheaper, 39. And as you say, there is the 30 uh, meter TMT and the slightly smaller GMT by different American institutions. Uh, the main ESO things for the available budget that they think they can have or get, uh, this is about the maximum size you can do. And 39 meter, you have to think in terms of area, is about twice as big as 30 meters, meaning you have four times advantage in, in uh, uh, sensitivity. And you also get the uh, better angular resolution, and especially for the exoplanets, I mean, every meter essentially counts. But, I mean, no one can blame uh, the TMT project for building a 30 meter. It will be a fantastic counterpart, and because it's on Hawaii, it will be on the northern hemisphere. So it's important to have another telescope on the northern hemisphere. And always in your environment, you have to make sure that you can actually build it. So I'm sure if, if the TMT project had said, well, we don't like that ESO has a 39 meter telescope, we make ours 40 meter, it would never see life in, in, in the near future. So there's always a, a big trade-off between science, technology, and economical boundary conditions. So, and, and the, the GMT project, for example, is also technically, it has a completely different pro uh, concept, which is made of of around mirrors, because the University of Arizona is a big player in that project. And their, their big uh, uh, well, contributions to astronomy, one of their big contributions in the past, has been to build, build these, these uh, huge 8 meter mirrors. And so they have not this concept of segmenting mirrors, and they do it differently. In the end, all of these projects will fail. Okay, five mirrors are more complex than three mirrors, but you must not forget that it has five mirrors, the ELT, because it includes adaptive optics. The TMT does not include it. It will need an extra adaptive optic system, which is in a big chamber, cooled down to minus degrees, so people have to work in this refrigerator. And so the problem is always there. Whether you have it in the telescope or later, if the control, if computers fail and do not control, you have lost. Oh, no. I will I will interrupt you just to explain. Estamos hablando del TMT, que es otro proyecto muy grande que hay, y comparando el TMT se va a construir en el hemisferio norte en Hawái. Entonces están, digamos, preguntando Leo sobre, digamos, cómo se compara con este proyecto y bueno, hay unas diferencias entre ellas. Nos menciona al final el hecho de que el ELT va a tener óptica adaptativa integrada mientras que el TMT va a tener un sistema aparte de óptica adaptativa. Entonces la segunda pregunta, the, the second question for the maybe at the discussion at the end. Hello, my name is Joseph, and my question is that how can they cost or how many money I shouldn't have to get to build a telescope with a kilometer of diameter. And other question is why it's so necessary to put the telescopes every time more bigger to see more things in the space. I don't comprehend it. El yo me está preguntando por el telescopio de un kilómetro y por qué lo están construyendo tan grandes. 
So if I understand correctly, you want to build a telescope of one kilometer. That's that's very brave. The problem is the problem is the polishing. Right? I used this example with polishing to one millimeter across the surface of Colombia. So the polishing takes a long time. And if you want to have such a big telescope in 10 years from now, you already need to start polishing the segments now. There are very few companies on this planet who can actually do this in time. And they have to make with 700 something segments. Right? You can look how many weeks there are in 10 years. You already have to polish a segment every week, essentially. This is much faster than what has been done in the past. Now, if you want to build a one square kilometer with such a precise optical mirror, well, your grand-grandchildren will have to assemble that telescope. Yeah, so this is a problem. Now, you may have heard about a square kilometer array, yeah, but this is a radio telescope. So they use radio dishes, and these don't need to be polished so accurately. So then you can fa manufacture them much faster, and in that sense, it's much easier to do. But for optical telescopes, it's almost impossible to go to that size. And you have to go to the big sizes simply because you want sharper images, and you want to see fainter objects. You need really the light. Hi. Well, the costs for the whole projects are actually not driven by the cost for the mirror anymore. So if this ELT is one billion, the primary mirror is only, I do not know exactly, maybe a tenth or a fifth of the total cost. You have a lot of costs for the building around and for the, con for the control of everything, the, the, the control system that keeps everything in place. All that is very expensive, but if you just take the mirror, well, you can calculate if, it's, if a 40 meter uh, mirror takes you, uh, say, 100 million, then, well, 40, then you need uh, 25 times the size. So what's the square of 25? And then you multiply it with 100 million. And you will realize that there is no one on this planet who could afford it. <laughs> Okay. Sí, el problema es pulir un espejo de un kilómetro, es muy problemático, eh, porque toma, tomaría 10 años pulirlo completo, por aquí hay una pregunta, tomaría 10 años pulirlo completo y probablemente sus bisnietos verían el telescopio completo, y el costo ya no está en el espejo, sino que está en todo lo que rodea el espejo, podría costar tanto que nadie estaría dispuesto a pagar. Uh, hi Bernard, hi. Um, my question is, uh, where is going to be orbiting the James Webb? Where the orbit is? Yeah, I mean, yeah. On the orbit. Okay, so so again, this is the sun and the Earth and the moon and and. The whole constellation here goes back to a, a French mathematician, Lagrange, who studied under what conditions three objects can stay uh, at the same distance with respect to each other. In the systems, there are actually mathematically a couple of solutions, or a handful, and these are called the Lagrangian points. And one of these stable points here is this Lagrangian point L2 which is 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth. And so that the uh, uh, James Webb telescope will essentially circle around this L2 point, far away. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, my, my question is, if you, well, we all agree that science has many questions right now. If you were the first person that work with this big telescope, what would the first thing you would look and why? What would be the first thing you would look and why? 
that, that is a very good question. And that maybe go back, may get, go back to your, your question like, how do we know now what science in 10 years will look like? And the honest answer is we don't. Right? We can't just use our best guesses. We cannot wait building instruments in 10 years from now. We have to do it now. And if we know that it's important to have very sharp images and, and record the standard wavelengths, then you have an instrument that's universal enough to do all kinds of observations. Right? So you don't build really specific instruments, except for maybe the hunt for exoplanets. Because we can be sure there will still many not discovered by then, so there will be an extra instrument looking specifically for exoplanets. But most of the other instruments in the science are very general, to be able to do all kinds of science. And so all the people involved in the projects now have to be very uh, yeah, open-minded and look what we see with the current facilities, with the ALMA submillimeter array in Chile, for example, with the space telescopes that are now up there, and, and see what, how science will change in these next 10 years. Of course, we all have to have propose something that we can do and make simulations and what we could see, but I'm pretty sure what will be done in 10 years is very different from what we imagine now. And that's also for, if I had the telescope now, I would probably look for some exoplanets. I would look for some forming stars and see how the, ex, how the planetary systems evolve. How the stars form and build a disk around them and where the planets are forming. This is something you can do. But whether we do the same in 10 years? I mean, 1995, we didn't know about exoplanets. We were all speculating, right? This is not so long ago. So, 10 years in the future? Exoplanetas, pero 10 años. No sabemos que podemos observar. Otra pregunta para In Spanish or in English? ¿Cómo se dice Bing Bang? ¿Y quién hizo el Bing Bang? What uh, she's asking about the Big Bang, uh, what really happens, and who made it. <laughs> this is a very good question, and I think many people are asking that, not only astronomers. And astronomers can only tell you what happened shortly thereafter. And if you want to know more, then you have to ask other people. <laughs> But it's actually interesting that many people ask about the Big Bang, like what was before, and few ask about the end of the universe, the future, especially now that we think it is expanding. Right? And it, it, it's accelerated in its expansion. So they can have all kinds of, of doomsday scenarios. And whether they are right or wrong, we don't know. But this is at least the same mystery, really, than, than the Big Bang itself. Muchos preguntan por el Big Bang, pero pocos por el futuro del universo. Hello, Professor. Uh, you just blew my mind that uh, thing you just said. <laughs> Really, I have never asked myself before about that. My question is about exoplanets. Uh, like about two months ago, I read about this exoplanet that was like measured the, the size and, and the color of it, and it turned out to be, I don't remember well, but like four times um, the, the Earth, and it turned out to be pink. So, I don't know if you have heard about it, I don't know if... My question is, that, like, how do you measure these this, this things? Like, the color of the exoplanet, or... like we... Well, of course, there are many measurements. If you talk about the color... Yeah, in, in, in that case, I presume this was direct imaging. Um, well, the problem, the problem is twofold. Uh, one is that some of these methods, like 
radial velocities or transits or so only give us information about some part, some aspect of the planet, like its mass or its orbital time. Or so we over, over many for many planets now we know some some things, but usually we do not know all the characteristics we like to know. This is one reason why you would like to image them directly and in maybe being able to take a spectrum. And then you can maybe measure some, some characteristics, whether this planet has an atmosphere and how that atmosphere looks like. For many planets, most of that is not known. But of course, if you can image it directly, then you can measure colors like, like we measure colors everywhere else in the universe. And one problem there is that we have not detected so many planetary systems, but none of them look like ours. Now you can say, well, there may be others, but at least we can rule out that in those systems where the planets are found, they look like ours. So at least around those stars, those many few hundred, how many do we know now? Almost 900 uh, stars, I think, with planetary systems. Yeah? And none of them looks like our solar system. And this is somewhat surprising. Right? So maybe we are special, at least in that part of the universe. At least it's not like, like people thought before, that, oh, there must be many planets, and we just look at them, and we find many like the Earth. Now, again, it's very, very difficult to find an Earth anyway. But now, we can at least say that the stars we looked at and we found planets, they don't look like our solar system. So we're, we're in that sense, our solar system is different. Okay, but let me, I have another important yes, remark. We're lucky, of course, to have an expert on exoplanets in Medellin. He's acting tonight as a translator. <laughs> so you are showing me the, the, the ball, no? <laughs> okay, no, I was asked about the color of the planet rosado, that the Lord has said in these days, and basically, the Lord has responded, that if you don't have an image direct, you can measure the color, and that's what basically says. Do you have a question? Good morning, I'm going to ask you in Spanish. La primera pregunta es, hace poco se descubrió un planeta que orbita alrededor de su estrella, eh, su, ro, su órbita eh, es alrededor de ocho horas, si sí, con el telescopio James Webb podría descubrirse un planeta más cercano a su estrella de, de esa distancia. Y la segunda es si el telescopio James Webb necesita otras medidas de seguridad más eh, aparte de las normales para proteger para la protección de basura espacial, rayos gamma y, eh, y ese otro tipo de rayos y, y las temperaturas del espacio. Two first questions. Can we detect a planet that is close, that too cl close to, to its start as to complete an orbit in less than eight hours, like the planet that was discovered around these days? And the, I mean, it's possible to detect this planet with the ELD. And the other question is, um, it can uh, how how the James Webb Telescope is protected against um, uh, space debris, ah. and gamma rays and, and other uh, harmful yeah. effects? Those are all very good questions. I think for the for the planet, if it if it has eight hours orbit, it's so close to the uh, to the star that you will not be able to direct it, directly image it. There is no way. So, I mean, the, the, the orbit is, the, yeah, it's too close. And, uh, I mean, what we know about the star then is probably from radial velocity methods or from, from occultations. But you will not be able to see it directly. The other thing is, how is the space telescope protected uh, against the debris? That's a very good question. There are, of course, the bigger debris pieces that would, would just destroy it. But space is empty, and we have to be lucky. <laughs> right, that's the same argument why the International Space Station works. And the International Space Station is in a much more dangerous orbit, with lots of debris that mankind is actually producing by sending up lots and lots of satellites that at some point malfunction and, and, and sort of disappear. But at the L2 point, space is empty. More or less. Now you can still have some debris. What is a problem, of course, is that you still have the cosmic ray 
bombarding the detectors. And so cosmic rays meaning each per each square centimeter you get something like like four high energy protons per second. So it's constantly bombarding all your equipment, the detectors and everything. And you will see this in the data and you have to filter it out somehow. But normally it does not destroy the image or the, the instrument. So normally you just live with the space environment. Okay, there's nothing we can do. Simplemente tenemos que tener suerte, no hay que estar protegido contra la basura espacial. De tal manera, este punto está mucho más vacío de lo que está, por ejemplo, el lugar donde está la Estación Espacial Internacional, pero lo que sí es un problema son los rayos cósmicos que producen algún ruido en la imagen, pero no logran destruir el telescopio. Bueno, tenemos la última pregunta. De todas maneras, podríamos estar aquí toda la noche. Y, y, do, ¿Do you have time to, to, to spend the night here? Or, or not? Hi. I remember having read something about a space probe that had speed anomalies and I think it resulted in being something about sun radiation bouncing against its surface that caused the anomalies in velocity. So could it be possible that given that the shielding of the James Webb telescope is so big that the solar radiation bouncing against its shielding could displace it from the Lagrange point? I'm, I'm not sure what the, the space mission is you're referring to. I, I know... Do you remember the I pi pi uh, yes. wire, right? The pioneer, pioneer anomaly. The, do you remember the pioneer al anomaly? That is, the, the pioneer is accelerating at a different pace that we expect. It's oh. called the pioneer anomaly. Uh, I should not comment on that, I'm okay. not sure. <laughs> I mean, the, the spacecraft, normally, you can control it. As long as you receive sufficient uh, uh, solar power, you should be able to navigate it. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's at the stable point. It's not like some space probes that have been sent out further and are traveling continuously. But I'm really not the right person to answer that question. Okay, good. Le voy a otro aplauso al profesor y... And again, thank you very much indeed. We are really pleased with your presentation. And, and now, the students participating in the... in the... training program will receive their their certificates. Vamos a entregarle los certificados a los estudiantes que participaron en el programa de Twinning Program. Es, es muy rápido. Lamentablemente yo no puedo retener a todos los que están aquí, pero queremos aprovechar este momento, es el último momento que tenemos con Bernard, para entregar estos eh, certificados. Además que le estrechan la mano a Bernard y de pronto tomen una fotito ahí. ¿No trajeron la mamá? No. Ok. They, they, they didn't bring their mothers. So. 